master these seven new terms and achieve a better NCE CPCE score. Hello, this is Dr. Howard Rosenthal, and this is no ordinary video. I have one goal here, and that goal is to give you the vocabulary power to do the very best job on your upcoming comprehensive exam. If you didn't learn these terms in grad school, or by surfing the web, parting, clubbing, just kidding, well, maybe not, slaving over a stack of textbooks, or pulling a string of all-nighters in the university library armed with an endless string of bags full of M&Ms and Skittles, you're going to learn them right now. So ready, set, let's do this. Term number one. Here's one that's hot off the presses. So there's no exact or precise definition. Just keep a close eye on this one as it gets off the ground since new definitions like this can quickly evolve. The term is predatory journal. P-R-E-D-A-T-O-R-Y. Predatory journal. In generally, this is currently a negative term referring to a journal that does not have a rigorous peer review process. In fact, it may not have a true review process at all. Journals of this nature are not associated with a major organization such as ACA, NASW, or APA, or even a recognized scientific publisher. The author or authors actually have to pay to the articles published and such publications often advertise they produce quick turnaround times, such as when you need a journal article by next Tuesday for your yearly promotion. Now, why, why would a counselor care about this? Well, let's look at a couple of possible examples. If you are a counselor educator trying to get tenure or a promotion at your university or college, only respected peer-reviewed articles may be acceptable for your promotion file. If you are a practitioner, some states will give you CEUs, continuing education units, for peer-reviewed or so-called refereed journal articles that you have written. Since a predatory journal, sometimes dubbed as an open access journal, would not fit this definition, it would not satisfy the requirements. Term two, person first language, can also be called people first language on some exams, written materials, and in professional settings. In both oral and written communication, the person should be designated first and then their condition. Thus, you should not say a visually impaired client, but rather a client with a visual impairment. Since the disability should not be the primary characteristic or defining feature of the person, it should not come first. To put it first is now considered dehumanizing. Again, it was not always this way. Person first language practices help to show respect for the individual. Term number three, board diversity. That's B-O-A-R-D, board diversity. This one goes out to all the counselors working in or wanting to establish your own non-for-profit or not-for-profit counseling agency. Definition one, the notion that a board of directors 
for a nonprofit agency should not, I repeat, should not, merely be composed of individuals working in the helping field, although that might be the best combination of people for an advisory board. As an example, a board of directors with no diversity, okay? Imagine a board composed of a licensed professional counselor, a licensed clinical social worker, a school psychologist, and a psychiatrist. Not a good composition. However, a board might be composed of an attorney, or better yet, several of them, with different specialties, a banker, a physician, an accountant, etc. Hence, board members from these areas could provide expertise that agency administrators and staff would generally not possess in areas related to business, marketing, money management, or the legal side of the organization. Definition number two, also possible. The notion that since agencies serve diverse groups of people, the board itself should have diversity, such as members who are African American, Asian American, Caucasian, Native American, etc. All right, term number four, advisory board. Since I used the term advisory board previously, I better make darn sure you know what I'm talking about. So what is an advisory board? In a nonprofit agency or educational program, an advisory board is a cadre of individuals who have expertise to improve the efficacy of the agency or the college and university program. Thus, a counseling program might have a private practice counselor or practitioner. It might also include a professor from a similar program from another educational institution. Might also include a graduate of the program now practicing in the field. All of these people could be on the advisory board. This can be contrasted to the board of directors or board of trustees. And again, this is composed of persons outside the field, such as an attorney, an accountant, or a banker. Serving on an advisory board is typically typically voluntary. One other little exam hint. If the exam question just says board and it doesn't tell you what kind of board, there's probably a 90% chance unless the context of the question leads you to have a different conclusion. There's probably a 90% chance that the exam question is talking about the board of directors and not an advisory board. Term five, placator communication style. That's P-L-A-C-A-T-E-R. According to the experiential family therapist, Virginia Satir, this is a person who tries to please everybody. Generally, this person is described as non-assertive, Again, this individual never disagrees with others. Why? The person is extremely worried about how others perceive them. This is seen as dysfunctional. Term number six, equine therapy, E-Q-U-I-N-E. -E. Now, you will hear it pronounced equine or equine. I really don't care how you enunciate it. The fact is that it's also called equine assisted therapy or harsh therapy. This approach, and this is the important part, uses horses, that's right, horses, to enhance the treatment process. A therapeutic activity such as grooming or feeding a horse in the presence of a professional 
would be an example of this modality. And I have to tell you, I have seen a lot of articles popping up about this in the counseling literature, so I would be aware of it. Term 7, Complementary Methods, C-O-M-P-L-E-M-E-N-T-A-R-Y, also known as Complementary and Alternative Modalities, or CAM, C-A-M. Practice, these are practices of treatment beyond traditional talk therapy, often referred to in the older literature as alternative treatments. In fact, sometimes they still use that uh, phrase. These would be things such as yoga, acupuncture, animal-assisted therapy, we just mentioned, earthing, grounding, nutritional strategies, herbal remedies, mindfulness, aromatherapy, massage, music therapy, or neurofeedback. Ethical guidelines stipulate that when using or referring clients for these CAM, or alternative treatments, counselors must have empirical scientific support for their use. The method in question should meet evidence-based practice, sometimes abbreviated on exams as EBP, and the guidelines, the, they should not be out of scope with a counselor's uh, scope of practice as outlined by state regulations. Now, that's a little vague, but at this point in time, most states do not prohibit or authorize complementary strategies. Functional medical doctors often champion CAM approaches. Here again, we're seeing a lot of articles about this in the counseling literature. It only seems natural that a few of these questions would pop up on the exam. All right, if you are looking for new terms that could fall into the new NCE domains on the new 2020 NCE, be on the lookout for my new second edition of the Human Services Dictionary. It has tons of uh, additions and it includes 650 possible new NCE CPCE terms. I'll talk to you soon. Peace out.